So today we're going to discuss about the packets because as we already said, this is a layer, the network layer, layer number three, all right? And on top of TCP, if it's TPCP that I'm using or UDP, if I'm using UDP, now we're going to add one more header, all right? So we started by the application, uh, the layer seven, TCP or UDP, and now IP. So, okay, so the goal is to uh, check about the header. So as for TCP, we will see that IP will have options, all right? Uh, we'll basically uh, see what are, uh, what things are in place uh, to be able to control either errors, but only in the header. We don't care about errors in uh, the data, the payload, and how to prevent forwarding loops, because the packet, if trapped in the loop, may uh, loop forever. Uh, we're going to discuss again about the length of the packet, and given that we may have some limitation due to the MTU, we may need to fragment the packet. So I will explain in which cases do we need this. Uh, then uh, we're going to see what goes inside the payload, uh, which means that we can have TCP, UDP, but as another protocol that we may have encapsulated is ISCMP. And ISCMP have been added for test reporting, uh, or error reporting, so whenever a packet is discarded, the um, receiver or routers may report the error by sending back a message, and those messages are ICMP messages, and this is basically what we uh, use when we do a ping or a trace route for those who already use those tools. These are I actually ICMP messages. So let's start with the header. So here it is, so as you may remember, so we have fields, the most important is to count the number of lines. So as you may see here, we have options. Here we have, uh, well, bytes, I'm sorry, octets, but we can call them bytes, it's more common. So it means that I have five lines. One of the things that we have is, as usual with those protocols, we have an alignment here, which is a four byte alignment. So it means that whenever the header, whatever is the length, including the options or without options, uh, the uh, the header length should always be a multiple of four because it's four bytes. So 20, it's a multiple of, of, of four. And if we have options, we can only have options such as uh, we can complete the last line, which means that we always need to add sometimes padding, for instance, okay? In order to make sure that we match this uh, requirement regarding the alignment, all right? Um, so a couple of things, even though everything is detailed in the next slides, okay, we may start looking at the, uh, at the few uh, fields right now. So what we have, we have the header length, which is pretty similar to TCP, but TCP, you remember, uh, it's also a four, uh, a four bit. So it means that here the value is a multiple of four to have it in bytes. If I have no options, it means that the size is 20 bytes with no options. What should be the value that goes inside the header length? Five. If we have the maximal size that we can have, if I put all the bits at one, I set them to one. So this is 15. 15 times four means that how many options can I have in total? The max length for the option, 60 minus 20, so 40. Then we have what we call the TOS field, TOS for type of service. It's not being used anymore. But it's interesting to see that back in the 70s, because IP before have been first introduced in the 70s, uh, we already consider that, yeah, packets may have different type of requirements and basically depending on the type of data. So it means that, for instance, we could ask the router to proceed, process a packet in a different way depending on the data. So that's why we have the type of service. So if we look into the details, even though nowadays let's be clear about it, routers don't even bother looking at this field because this is totally not relevant nowadays, okay? But if we look at that time, what they used to do, which was pretty interesting, they have three bits here, flags, and those were the DTR field, D for delay, T for throughput, and R for reliability. Oh my God, okay? So it means that we could combine bits here by setting those flags to one. And it was a way, if routers could be able to provide for a given destination multiple passes, 
we could ch choose the one that actually fits our requirement. Like we want a fast one, like a short delay. We want more capacity, like a higher throughput. We want it to be reliable with less losses. So if routers could come and compute multiple routes for destination, we could use it. But nowadays, routers in the internet for one destination, one path. So we don't have any choices. So those bits are actually not really useful since we have only a single path. And last, here we have a field, which is a priority field. And that's really interesting because basically when the packets arrive at a router, you remember we have a queue, all right? Because the CPU may be uh, occupied. So we need the routers, the, the routers to put the packets in a buffer, all right? So basically, most of the time we do FIFO, okay? First in, first out. But at that time, people realize that actually if we need to have a different type of service, which means that we need to treat some packets faster than others, all right? Uh, we may consider the value of the priority, such as a way to check which packet should be processed next instead of doing FIFO. So that's the reason here we have a field which was uh, supposed to uh, classify the packets according to different level of priorities. Understood? So is it okay with this field? So that was just the tools, okay? So two things, three flags plus the precedent. Okay, let me clean and let's carry on. So this is a total length, including the header, okay? Including header. So which means that if the total is, for instance, 140, 80, and this is five, what is the size please here of the payload? 140, 60, okay? Because I need to remove the header from there, and five indicates that this is a five byte long header. All right, so this is the total length. Uh, obviously, you see that we, can, we may have up to uh, packets which are two power 16 byte long, right? Uh, which is huge. I mean, it's almost 64,000. So that's quite amazing. And we probably never going to see such a big packet, right? But anyway, this is something that is possible. Uh, those ones here, the next uh, word here, we're going to keep it for later. This is in case we need to fragment the packet. So I'm going to come back to this other slide to explain how to do the fragmentation. All right. So let's keep it for now. Then we have the TTL. So the TTL is pretty interesting. This is a kind of, um, of a counter that actually will decrement okay, the value. Each router that I traverse will basically decrement that value until the TTL reaches zero. And if I haven't yet uh, delivered the packet at the receiver and the TTL reached zero, then we discard the packet. Okay, so this is an easy way to say that, well, a packet is actually is trapped in a loop we should kill the packet, otherwise there's no way we can remove this packet. To remove it, the routers, they will decrement this value, and then they will basically um, uh, send maybe an ICMP message that we were gonna discuss at the end of the lecture. So what is the maximum value for this? Since this is an eight bit field, very good answer. So it's two power eight minus one, which is 255. So guys, is anybody like shocked by this value? How many hops do we have? How many routers should we cross before we reach a destination? According to you guys, just give me a wild guess. I know that maybe you're not really aware of this, but what should be like a, 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 a feasible value? I mean, so it should be between 15 and 20 hops. So you may see that with 255, we are pretty far from this like couple of tens of routers. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, hopefully because you see the more routers I need to traverse, the more delay I'm gonna have, right? So my question is the following. So why should we have such a long field given that actually this is the length of a path? And what is more, something that is a little uh, worrying is the fact that the, there's here a notion of time time to leave. So what does it mean by time? Well, guys, you know, in the beginning, what the routers were supposed to do is to actually count the number of milliseconds that a packet will wait at a router. And depending on the number of milliseconds, we could be like less than a couple of milliseconds. I was supposed to decrement that value from the TTL. 
But you know what happened? Soon enough, the routers get super fast. And nowadays, this is not the milliseconds, but it's three, three hundreds of nanoseconds. So it means that now, if I want to keep talking about the time, now I need to be able to decrement multiple hundreds of nanoseconds. But you see that it could be like 400 nanoseconds, 600 nanoseconds. And you see that not, it's not consistent with the length of the field. So since we have this discrepancy now because, between the duration in nanoseconds, because there's no more milliseconds anymore, what we said, we said, okay, let's lose the time. And instead of the time, let's talk about hops, all right? But that's the reason we call it time at that time, all right? Understood? So nowadays, sp packets spend, yeah, a few hundreds of nanoseconds at the routers. So we cannot use timing anymore, durations, so we use the hops. The next that we have, so sorry guys, the next that we have is the following, we have the protocol. And as uh, indicated here, this is the type of the header in, that I have in the payload, all right? So basically, what can I have? If I have, if I have TCP, the value gonna be 0, 06. If it's UDP, oops, why did I put the, the D before? Oh my God, let me go back. So uh, UDP, yeah, well, it doesn't want to correct it. So UDP, it's 0, 011. If it's ICMP that we're gonna see later, it's 0, 0, 001. All right, so we have typical values of protocols that may be encapsulated in IP, which mean are running on top of IP, all right? So that's the reason we have TCP, UDP, which are pretty standard, or even ICMP. Understood? So this is the protocol field. Then we have a checksum, and as indicated by the name, this is a header checksum. So what we need to know as well is like the checksum is only here to protect the header, but what happened is like at the beginning, routers were supposed to guarantee that the checksum was right, was valid. So we were doing error detections at routers. But as the internet gets more reliable in the core network, finally, the routers would stop checking the headsum, the, checking the checksum anyway. And the only location where actually I'm gonna check if there's an error is the receiver. So nowadays the routers don't really check the checksum. The only thing that they need to do, they need to update that value. Very good answer. Yes, the TTL changed, so I need to uh, apply that change for the checksum, right? But actually, this is the only thing that I do. And it's pretty simple to apply the change because, you know, we just do minus one. So if you do minus one, it's pretty simple to go look at that, right? So anyway, so that's the checksum. I have a slide showing you how do I do the calculation. I promised this when I did TCP, but here we have a detailed one. Then we have the IP addresses, so the source and the destination. So the source, we know it through the DHCP, and this one through DNS. Okay, this is just to remember about that. We may have options. We're going to see a list of possible options. And there's, I think that there's a question regarding one of the options in the assignment, so uh, keep an eye on this. And then the date. All right, so you still have some uh, details here that I provided. Okay, you, you may read. Okay. So let's see about the fragmentation. So guys, you're gonna tell me, yes, but you told us that actually, you know, when we have TCP running on top of IP, TCP will pass the MSS, such as this match the MTU of layer two, right? Okay, such as the, the IP packet may match exactly the size of the MTU of a frame. Do you remember about this with the MSS? Okay. So here what you see, should understand is like actually the MTU that I'm using for the MSS at the source is a local MTU, is a local one. So which means that I can go through a router and the next, the MTU of the next network could be smaller. So in that case, you see I'm receiving large packets and somehow I need to either discard the packet or fragment the packet. That's the reason we still need to have something to be able to handle the fragmentation. Is that okay? All right, so let's look how it works. So from what you can remember, so that field is actually, I'm gonna draw it here, so the four bytes. So we have the identificator, uh, uh, identificator or identification, I don't remember exactly the name. So that is a unique value, so it means that any packet that a source will issue needs to have a unique value for that one. All right, 
So done. So this value is random. Okay. And usually it's not really random. The first value ever is random, and then we just increment this value because it's enough to increment the initial value. Then what we have, we have reserve, DF, and MF. And the DF and the MF are shown below. So the DF is the DOM fragment. For some reason, maybe the source doesn't want the packet, even if too large, to be fragmented. So it means that if I put it to one, that router will discard the packet because it's too big and I cannot fragment it. If I should be able to fragment it in network, I should put zero. Okay, I should set this bit to zero. And then we have the MF, and as indicated by the name, it may it indicates that this is not the last. So if there are fragmentation, the MF is going to be equal to zero for the last one. All right, for the last one. So it means that let's say if I have a packet here uh, that is actually fragmented in three pieces, so I'm going to have one, two, three. So it means that the MF of this one should be equal to zero because there are no more fragments, and the MF of those ones should be equal to one. Sorry. Okay. Understood why we need that one? So now we know exactly which one is the last one. But you see, the MF cannot tell us actually which one, which fragment is the first one or the second. So to, able, to be able to reassemble the fragment in the right order, I'm going to use a fragment offset, which come here. Okay? And the fragment offset is the total side of the preceding fragments, okay? And that value is divided by 8. Okay? So let's take the example here. So I have 13 bytes. And what is the 13 bytes of data? Okay? And the MTU1 is 1,500. And the MTU2 is 576. All right, so let me see. If I do white, you see I don't know that. So what it means? It means that actually when I receive this first packet, so it means that between the source and the first router, can anybody give me the size of the packet here? So which means that I have 320, you have no options. So this is the size of the packet. So the packet will come with the header, IP header, which is 20, and 1,300 of data, okay? So that may be TCP, that may UDP, whatever. It doesn't make a difference, right? So now what's going to happen, this router, so sorry, this is a destination, another receiver is better to say that. So since we have an MTU of 576, okay? So what it means? The MTU, you may remember, is whatever is at the frame, the layer two, which have a trailer. And here in the middle, this is the maximum size of what I can encapsulate in here. So it means that if I look at the packet, the packet may come with a header, IP header of 20, plus the data. Okay? So it means that actually the data here, what is the maximum size for the data of an IP packet that I can encapsulate it? What should be the size, guys? Okay, 556. Okay? But be careful. Be careful what's going to happen now. So I'm receiving this data here at this router. So the router say that, oh, I need to make the payload match this size. So I'm going to fragment the, the packet, right? So I'm going to fragment it in three pieces. But let's look, what should be the size of each fragment? Because you see, I'm going to add an IP header to each of them. So what should be the size of each fragment here without a header? So I have F1, F2, F3. So let's get the detail of fragment one, fragment two, and fragment three. First of all, all of them will have the same ID with the original packet. Okay, so the ID is the same. So first of all, we're going to put the DF and the MF. So the, uh, the DF and the MF of the original packet, so let's put the original packet here. What was the DF and the MF of the original packet and the FO? So the FO is zero. The more fragment is zero because it was not fragmented. And the DF, obviously, was zero. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to fragment. 
So it means that if I was able to fragment the first time, I can fragment the second time. So df equals zero, df equals zero. What about the MF of fragment two? Can anybody give me the value of the MF of fragment two? Oh, no, sorry, it was one here. So what is the MF of second fragment? Okay, and what is the MF of the last one? Zero. So let's look at the fragment offset. So we said that the fragment offset is the size of the preceding fragments divided by eight. So the, the fragment offset of the first one is the first, so there's no other fragment in front of him, right? Before him. So the fragment offset should be zero. Now let's look at the fragment offset of fragment two. So what is the size of fragment one? If we go according to, uh, to what is given here, what should be the size of the fragment? We said that the value should be divisible by eight. So is it a good value? Can I divide 556 by eight? Is it divisible? No. So too bad, I cannot use that value. No good. So which one should I use? So I should use the closest one, right? So 56 divided by eight equal 69.5. So 69 times eight, it should be yeah, five, five, two. And this value, it's eight times 69. Very good answer. So it means that the fragment offset now, oops, sorry, should be equal to 69. Because this is the size divided by eight of the first one. So let's look at the fragment offset of the last one. So how many fragments in front of it? Two. So it's two times 552. So what should be the value that I should put here? Two times 69. So here we are. You see, so we are here, right? So we have 16 bits for this one. How many bits for the fragment offset, guys? 13, all right? My question goes as follow. So the fragment offset, we said that this is the length divided by eight. My question is why eight? Why do we divide it by eight? You see the fragment offset have a very strange value. The length is 13. Is 13 something that makes sense for your, your register or your CPU? No, 13 is very weird, it's awkward. So most probably what's going to happen in order to process that value, I need to make it look like a 16-bit field. To make that switch from 13 to 16, what is the easiest way of switching from 13 to 16, guys? Is to complete this with three zeros. So if I do that, yes, I don't have 13 anymore, but I have 16. But if I add three zeros, what does it, what does it do at the value, right? So this is three. If I put 11, zero, what is the new value here? So it means that it goes six. If I do zero, zero, it goes 12. So you see, so I multiply by two, 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 and so on. So it means that doing this is like I multiply by eight. Knowing that I need to multiply by eight, I divide by eight before. You see, so this is pretty interesting. Okay, now let's say the source goes, so you have the first packet here, goes to the router, and we say that because of the fragmentation, you have three fragments. And it goes to the destination. Is that correct? You understand the, 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 the figure here? Is it okay? All right. So let's say out of them, one is lost. My question goes as follows. And you should ask yourself the same question. So should the source retransmit the whole fragment? Should it retransmit only the missing fragment? The, the oh, Sorry, the whole packet? the missing fragment or something else. Is IP reliable? No. So do, do I need to worry at the IP level that the fragment or packet is lost? I mean, that, is that in you? I mean, does IP really care about this? Of course not. So IP does nothing, but, but we have a problem here because even if I do nothing, it means that I have two fragments that have been received and I'm waiting for the last one, which will never come ever, ever, ever. So what should I do with those? I'm not gonna keep them forever. 
Otherwise, I'm going to start, you know, yeah, exactly. It doesn't care about the problem, but still, I need to care about those two guys. What should I do with them, right? When is it safe to discard? The destination will actually use locally the TTL, okay? And instead of being a router decrementing the TTL, the destination will decrement virtually those TTLs as if those fragments were still in flight en route in the network. So it means that if these ones get to zero, most probably F3, the same happened to F3. So yes, we use locally the TTL, which is like not really the good usage, but we don't have any other choice because we cannot have an IP timer because there's no states in IP. So we use the existing information, which is a TTL. All right, so here I show you like a typical IP uh, packet. So actually it's not IP. So we have, the blue one is Ethernet, as you may see. Uh, IP is here, right? And then as you may see, we have uh, TCP, even though we don't worry about what is inside. The 06 here, uh, I'm going to put in green. Yeah, you can spot it. And this is a protocol, so 6 TCP. All right, so that's it. So here, those are the bytes of the header. You see, so I take 16 bits, two bytes at a time, and I put them in a column such as I can sum all of them. So here, what I put in gray shaded is an intermediate result, as you may track the values, okay? Can you see? Those are plus this, plus this, plus this, plus this, and so on, you see? So I just give you here the intermediate results, all right? So you just take two bytes at a time, you add them together, all right? And as you may see, the checksum, since this is the source, the checksum doesn't exist yet, so the checksum initially is zero. I do the sum. What is interesting here is to see that you see we have the carry, and that I need to re-inject it in order to get the final result, you see? And so finally, what I take is a complement one. You see, complement one, all right? And so that's the value that actually I use in the checksum, which is here. So you see how I calculate it? This is very simple. Is that correct? Okay, everybody got it? How can I have the, the, the right column here? By taking the bytes, I put them in binary. And as I said, those are the intermediate results just to help you tracking the final result. So now this is a sort. So let's look at the destination. The destination, I do the same, but I'm going to keep the checksum in the calculation. And at the end, what I expect, as I told you, since the source put the complement one in the checksum, the final value should be all ones. If I have all ones, it means that there's no error in the header. And that's it. Okay? So even though we're going to see more examples, uh, let's look. So this is a version. So this is version 4. What is the size of IHL, guys? 5. So it means that do I have any option? No, it's 20 bytes. No options. Is that correct? Then we have the toast. Then we have the total length. So it is 0048. 4 times 16 plus 8 goes 72, all right? Which means that the TCP, how much is the TCP? What is the size of TCP? So I need to do minus 20, goes 52 for TCP. Is that okay for the data? Because I remove the header from the 72, and this is what I get. So this is a, the protocol. Uh, what is the TTL here? Can anybody give me the value of the TTL? It goes 30, okay? for the TTL. Anyway, you will see. So what I suggest you do, uh, actually there's an interesting reading that you can do in Google to see that actually depending on the operating system that you're using, the default value of the TTL, it depends on the, on the, on the, on the operating system. So Mac, for instance, and uh, Linux or Unix use like some specific values, like maybe it's 128, I'll let you check. Uh, Windows may use 64 or 32, so we have like typical TTL values that depend on the operating system. All right, so let me move on because we are really, really late. So we have then the IP addresses, the source IP, 32-bit because we are in IPv4, so they are unique. So usually for the destination, we learn them through DNS, obviously, and as a source, uh, usually it's DHCP, which actually let us learn what is the IP and next 
week, we're going to study the IG. Um, so yeah, so the source uh, IP address is a little weird because uh, we can uh, spoof it. So it means that we can pretend to be somebody else. So nobody, almost no time, there will be anybody checking about the IP of the source IP packet. And this is an easy way of launching a, a, a attack. So for instance, you can do a DOS attack, which is like a denial of service attack, which means that I can send excessive packets to a destination. And to in order to hide myself as the attacker, what I may do, uh, I can maybe spoof the IP of somebody else, such as to prevent like, oh, it's coming from that source. Okay, so I can do that to evade the spoofing, but I can also use the source as uh, the, uh, the, the, the final attack. So what I mean by that, I may, you know, send multiple packets to, uh, well, to multiple servers, all right? And so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna send a packet by pretending I'm somebody else on the network. So it means that if I pretend that this is a source and I send the packets like this, and I can launch multiple attacks like this, you may see that the server is going to answer to whom? They're going to answer to us. And given the number of messages that you're receiving from those servers, this, that, that specific sender may be, may be uh, overwhelmed. Okay, so this is another way of doing the attack. Okay, so I may hide myself, but I also can provide the IP of somebody who I want to be harmed. So it means that Many of us start asking to some servers to reply to somebody else who we are not, and this guy is going to be overwhelmed. So this is another type of, uh, of attack. So let's just do a quick, uh, a quick check here. So as you may remember, when we have the traces, so uh, sometimes we're going to provide the first column with the number of the, 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 uh, with the number, which is actually the number of the first byte here. You see? So this is the number of the first byte. So which means that on each line, I have 16 bytes usually. Okay. So that's the reason we go from zero to 10 because it goes from zero to 16, 16, okay? Since we have 16 bytes. So here, what we can see, we can see that this is ethernet. And you may remember that a typical value here is this value for the type. So this is a type value. And that indicate that this is IPv4 that is actually encapsulated. And as we can see, yes, this is an IP packet. And then, as I said, because of the value 06, we can see that this is TCP. So once again, the IHL, which is five, tell us that there's no, it has no option. So this is 20. And that basically the size, and the size of the total packet is 72. So which means that for, Ethernet, uh, for TCP, what we have, so 72, I'm sorry, the seven looks terrible. Okay, so it means that for TCP, I have 52. So this is how you do the calculation, all right? So here, and here, those values are pretty typical, so you need to check those first. All right, so this is the IP packet. So I just replaced the values from the previous capture, and that's the reason here. Once again, total leg 72, THL 20. So it means that the, uh, the, the size of the segment is 52. Okay, no options here. Okay, so here I put the detail of the, uh, the capture analysis, so we have all the values. Let's talk a little about the options. So the options come after the 20 bytes if the IHL is greater than five. So it means that we have options, okay? And uh, the type of options that we may have, so it's interesting because as for TCP, we have the padding at the end. We have zero one for no operation to space out the options in the header. And then we may have multiple options. So here I put a couple of them. There's a lot of them, right? So we have like, uh, 7, 68, 101, 107. And so I put them because first of all, here we have the loose routing and the strict routing. So what do we mean by that? We mean that in the header, what I may do, I may provide in the 40 bytes of the options, the list of routers that I want the packet to go through. So it means that the decision to forward the packet depends on the list of IP addresses that I provide in the header. So when it's strict, it means that the packet can only go through that specific list of routers. If it's loose, it means that the routers that I provide the IP for, they are like kind of rendezvous point where I can jump from one to the other by visiting other routers. That's the reason we call it the loose route. Okay, so it's pretty interesting. Um, another thing that is interesting is that option here. And one of the homework questions about the record route. 
And what it means, it means that when my packet go through routers, so the routers gonna record their IP address in the option. So let's see how it works. So here, what I show you is once again, is this IPv4? Yes, it is. Do we have options? What is the size of the options here, guys? So F is 15 time four goes 60. So it means that the options, we have 40 of them since we have 20 for the fixed header, okay? So 40. So let's look now at how to read an option. So you remember from the list, so the first field in the option is the type that indicates the type. So 07 means that this is the root, the record route. And so what it means, the next one is the total size of the option. So we have type, then length. And here you may see we have 27. So 27 in decimal is 39. So can you tell me how many options in that header? Two. Yes, Thomas. Why? Because the first one is the route record, but this is only 39. But we said that the total size is 40. So it means that we have the 0, 0, 0 option, which is, you remember, the end of option. And this value is zero. So that's the reason I put in, in here. So anyway, so when we have the option 07, okay, so with the, 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 we have a third field, which is a pointer. And the pointer is then indicating which byte is available where the router can start writing the IP address to avoid, you know, overwriting something already existing. So it means that when I pass the next router, the router will basically record its IP here. So it means that now this value need to jump to the next one. So from four, what is the next value of, of, this, of this option, guys, of the pointer? What is the next, next value? If I already, one, one I, we were here, because one IP address is four bytes. So the next time is gonna point to zero eight and so on. So can you tell me if I, reach a very long path, what, what is the maximal value for the pointer? Nine. Very good answer. Yeah, we have nine spots, right? Nine slots for this. So it means that at the end, I'm going to point to the last byte. And the last byte is the byte 40. Anyway, so here it is. So here I analyze uh, the previous uh, one uh, with the fact that what we didn't say here, and I'm going to clean, is the fact that if I look at the next header, which is here, this is a protocol. So it means that the protocol that is encapsulated is ICMP. Okay? So this is what I have here. Oops. Let's go here. All right? So this indicates that this what we have here is ICMP. Good. So we have 20 bytes. So the F is indicating that actually we have 40 bytes, and that basically the last one, given that we have 39, it means that the last byte of the four, out of the 49 bytes is a bit of padding, right? A specific option. So two options here, all right? So when, so yeah, uh, just a second. So it means that once we're going to reach the final router, we can only cross nine routers. So something that is very important. When you go through the source and you go to the destination, basically what's going to happen is you're going to go through routers here on the way down. I'm gonna have enough space, so I need to go even further. Sorry for the D. Uh, two, three. Yeah, oh, let me go again. So I'm gonna cross routers, then reach the destination. And what's happened with the route record? I can record them on the way back. Uh, nine and then average the source, okay? So it means that you see, so we have nine routers, but basically they are giving this way and the destination gonna be in the middle. So if I look inside, once I reach, I'm gonna have the first router, router two, router three, router four, then I'm gonna have the IP of the destination, which should be the same with this one. Then here I have R5, 
air six, air seven, air eight, and air nine. Do you understand how it works? So actually I record the IP addresses on the way to go and on the way back. So I have like the round trip, all right? I record all the IPs. And obviously in the question that you have in the assignment, we're gonna consider that those are symmetric. So what it means, it means that once I go from S to this one and I have the first router, so this is the IP that I'm gonna register first because you remember a router have two IPs, two IPs. So this is the IP of router one. And on the way back, I'm gonna have the other IP of this router that are gonna be registered here, IP two, all right? So it means that the first IP here will be IP one and the last one gonna be IP two, all right? And this is the case for all the routers. Air eight, uh, yes. Uh, air eight, yes, it was eight, you're right. Yeah, I didn't count well, okay? So that's the way it is. So just remember. Oh, if we have more routers, so in that case, you won't be able to have all the IPs listed. And that's the reason this option is not very popular. It's been replaced with another tool. But that's a very good question, okay? So let's talk a little bit now. So let me hurry up because we're gonna be late. So this is the conclusion here. So as we said, so in the header, we, we have the checksum to see if some header is, is corrupted. This is why, because if the IP destination is corrupted, the packet will go somewhere wrong. So we still check, we're still supposed to check the header to make sure that actually the packet reached the right destination, okay? But there won't be any problem because of this. And we also have the TTL to uh, discard a packet if it has, if it, if it's captured in the forwarding loop, all right? So we can have large packets. In that case, we may want to fragment them if the DF equals zero. If it's one, it's going to be discarded. And then each of the fragments will basically match the size of the MTU on that network. Uh, the payload of the packet may be uh, TCP, UDP, or even ICMP. So let's talk a little bit about ICMP before the end of this lecture. So as you may remember, we talked about IP. So we talked already about the IP addresses, the structure of the header, and how to process the packets, including when to fragment them, when to discard them. Uh, the way the IP is designed, there's no feedback in case of trouble. So that's the reason we added a new protocol to the network layer, such as we can receive some kind of feedback from the network indicated what went wrong, all right? So let's talk about ICMP. Once again, this is for uh, uh, forwarding, uh, troubleshooting forwarding. So if we have any troubles when we forward the packet at the router or at the receiver when we try to deliver the packet to the transport layer. So if something is wrong, we're gonna send a, a message back, L. Uh, we may also have other type of messages which are what we call the echo messages. Those are used for the ping, all right? We're gonna talk about it in a minute. So it runs on top of IP, so it means that even if ICMP is part of the layer three, okay, it's just like an add-on that have been done here, but we still need IP to send the message. So ICMP is encapsulated in IP, and the protocol field is zero is one or in hex zero one. All right. So it is used for error diagnosis. So whenever there's a problem of any kind, there may be multiple of them. For instance time ex exceeded, packet too large, okay? The time exceeded is one DF equals zero. Uh, packet too large is when the DF is equal to one and I cannot fragment. Or the destination is not reachable, for instance, when uh, in the table of the router, there's no route for this packet. What should I do? Well, I should discard the packet and indicate maybe to the source, well, you know something? I don't know about that destination. I don't have a route. So a message, is a header, obviously. And what is interesting, it may have some data, but also, oh wow, this is French here, I need to, do, to uh, change it, and a copy of the pack. I'm gonna ex explain it in a minute. So here I give you an example, so I still have IP here, and because of that protocol, here it means that it's ICMP. Any ICMP message always has this header. The type, the code, and the checksum. And here are some messages that may there's some information that may be specific to the message. Let's look at a few examples. So the type. So it means that is this a, 
error message or information message such as the one that I use for the pin. I have a table later. The code is, is the cause of the error. So for the same type, I may have multiple causes. So for instance, if I tell you that the type is uh, the time exceeded, is there only one reason for time exceeded or there are at least two reasons? Can anybody tell me one code or two codes? It's easy answer, two, yes, Lay. We're gonna see that, Andrew checks it. So let's look at the different messages that we have. So interestingly, we have, as you may see, codes that share the same type, all right? And you see for the time exceeded, we have two codes. One is the TTR equals zero, but this one is when the fragment is missing. So you remember that because the TTL may either be because I reached a router and my TTL reached zero, or it may be a fragment already arrived at the destination, but the TTL reached zero. So two reasons, okay? Uh, we have the echo request and the echo reply. So those are what I do when I send a ping. I use a request and the destination is supposed to send me back a reply, all right? So anyway, so here is the echo, reply, echo request with the type zero and the reply with the type zero, eight zero, sorry. The code is always zero in that case. And what do I have specifically to the echo? I have some uh, uh, longer header, one with the, with the identifier and one with the sequence number. Why do I, am I doing this? Because let's say I'm a source and I want to send a ping to multiple destinations. And let's say part of those destinations, I'm not gonna send only one message, I'm gonna send multiple messages as part of the ping. So now what's gonna happen, I'm gonna receive multiple re replies and I need to be able to match them to one, what is the destination? So for each destination, I'm gonna have a specific ID. So I'm gonna have ID one, ID two, because I don't have access to the IP address anymore. I'm in ICMP. And for each messages that I send to each of them, I have the sequence number. Okay, so it means that part of each ping, I need to ID with the number each of the pings. So what is interesting is out of this, uh, my machine gonna compute uh, the round trips. So I'm waiting for the corresponding re reply to be received. So based on this reply, I'm gonna calculate uh, the round trips. Plus, I'm gonna count the number of losses to see how reliable is the path to that destination, okay? So the time exceeded, as we already explained, so it uses, uh, is when the TTL reached zero, so it may happen when a fragment is missing or when a router decrement the TTL and so uh, we cannot forward the packet anymore because the TTL is zero. So what is interesting here is, you know, as part of the message, when is the error, I'm gonna copy part of the original packet inside the ICMP message and I send it back to the sender. And so I have a first header and then the inside of the header, which is a copy of the message that uh, created that problem. It means that you see I receive an IP packet. This IP packet have a failure. So back, I'm gonna send an ICMP message and part of the ICMP message will contain actually a copy of the packet that was in trouble. Oops, sorry. IP stateless. What do I mean by stateless? I have no memory. So it means that when I send the packet, I have no memory of sending the packet. So it means that I totally forget about this packet because I don't have any states where I can put the IP packet in a buffer. So when I receive an error message, I'm kind of, I lose my memory, you know, I don't even remember sending the packet. So in order to be able to understand what happened, first I need to remember that I sent this packet. So which packet? So I have a copy here, you see? So this is a kind of a mobile state that instead of keeping a state for the packets, they sent me back the packet which was in, in trouble. You understand? So I think it's pretty interesting what they're doing here. So you see, so we don't need states because we basically put them inside the packet. Um, to go back to uh, what we said before, so Leia asked the question, they say that we have the, uh, the option route record, but we are limited. We can only have uh, four routers, okay? Because that's gonna give us eight IPs that I can record in the option, right? 
because eight IPs is less than 40 bytes. So what should I do when I have more than four bytes, the four routers? So what we did, we replaced that option by the trace route. And the trace route is nothing more than a ping. So what do we do when we do that? Look at that. What we do, let's say we have a destination here, and I want to check what is the path to reach the destination. Well, what I'm going to do, and that's pretty clever what they did, right? They said that, okay, so I'm going to start sending a ping, but I'm going to use a TTL of one. So what it means is when I reach that router, what's going to happen to the packet? I'm going to discard it. And the router, since I have a TTL, I'm supposed to send a time exceeded. So this way, I'm forcing the first router to answer me. So I'm going to discover its IP. So the next step, I'm going to do a TTL of two. And so it means that this guy will need to send me a, a time exceeded ICMP message, such as I can discover the IP of this guy. And so you see, I'm going to do by going, by increasing the TTL, I'm going to discover the IPs of all the routers on the way. You see how we do now to discover the IP of all the routers? Okay, so I think it's pretty clever. But something that is less powerful is the fact that if you look at basically the IP that you're going to discover is the IP of the router here. This is the IP that I'm going to discover for each of those routers. But can I know about this IP here? Because you see the router have multiple IPs. Can I learn about the other IP? No, I cannot. But the, the option, let me do this. You see what I mean? The option, let me actually discover both IP addresses thanks to the uh, uh, route report, okay? So, but it's better than nothing. You see what I mean? Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to discover the routers that are too far away, okay? So I think it's pretty nice what they did, okay? Uh, another thing that uh, some, some students asked me, and I think that is, is a, this is a, a relevant question, is uh, some of the students, they asked me the following. They say, oh, yes, but let's say I have a packet, right? with uh, an option. And here, this is the IP 120 and 40. And I may have some data here, right? So one of the questions that they're asking me is like, let's say if this packet is fragmented, what should I do with the option? You may read regarding, you remember options have a type. And do you remember the type of option uh, RR is 007? And if you go back to uh, the, uh, the, um, the uh, loose or strict routing, the value is much more bigger. It's like 100 something, right? 37 or eight, seven, okay. So basically guys, you may read, but the type is actually the eight bit of the type have a bit here, which actually is very relevant for the options. So either you may set it or don't set it. And you may see that when it's RR, this byte is zero. When you have uh, the loose routing, this byte is set to one, okay? So depending on if you set it or not, you indicate to the router that either the option may be duplicated to other fragments, or you may indicate to the router that you should only keep the, the, the option in one of the fragments, or you may tell to the router that if there's an option, you shouldn't, you shouldn't fragment the packet. All right, so there are multiple behaviors. You may read about it. Okay, so let's go over. Uh, no, this is already done. So why am I going back? So yes, oh, yeah, I, I did go back just to show you the ICMP message. So you may see that here, because this is part of the, of the, of the homework. This is 01, so this is ICMP. So it means that here I have ICMP. I look at the type. This is a code, and this is a checksum. And if I look at the type, 08 is which type? Is IC, uh, is echo or echo what? Echo request, okay? So in order to make sure that I receive a reply, I do an echo request, such as then I'm gonna receive the reply. All right, at the destination. And on the way back, I'm going to complete the list. 
uh, so this is a checksum. This is the uh, the um, the identifier, and here are the sequence number. And then we have a bunch of other information. Okay, guys. So it was just to show you this. All right. So as a conclusion for uh, IP. So once again, uh, the IP uh, packet have a header of a maximum size of sixty bytes. Okay, including zero or forty bytes of options. Uh, then uh, in the header, we may uh, want to fragment a packet if it's too large compared to the local MTU, okay, which is the maximum size of the data that can be encapsulated in a frame. Okay? Uh, so on top of this, since IP is quiet, so even when you discard or you drop a packet, IP will remain totally quiet. We still need to have some tools in order to be able to uh, tell what happened. So in the case of ICMP protocol, we have uh, the echo request and reply. So those are used by the ping or the trace route commands. And those are used to do some connectivity tests. And on top of this, we have some uh, message types, which are for error reporting. So either it's a router when there's a forwarding or routing trouble or troubles, right? In order to troubleshoot any uh, forwarding or routing problems. And from the host, when we cannot deliver a packet for some reason, uh, the receivers as well may reply with a SIMPMP uh, protocol or message, okay? So guys, that's it. Uh, we still have a few minutes for questions. So thanks for attending. I hope that you, you got all, all well. So as I said, probably this homework for next week, gonna have one question regarding fermentation and another one regarding uh, the uh, route, the record route, okay?